So, ladies and gentlemen, please take the seats. We will continue the afternoon session. I hope that you got something to eat and coffee or tea or something to drink. The coffees will stay there for the whole afternoon. We will continue without a, a break. And after the block, we will have a small reception. We, will, we would like to invite you for a glass of wine. Just will come the afternoon session, which will present our three finalists. The session will be moderated by Martin Palouš, who is a board member of Václav Havel Library, a former director. He was in charge in my position before I came to the library. And I would like to invite here Teng Biao, who is the representative of the Chinese finalist Rights Defense Network, the Kaha Kozhorice from the Georgian Young Lawyers Association, and as the most important person for all day, the Natalia Pinchuk, wives of Alex Bialitskis. Please come. Good afternoon, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we already have been introduced by Marta Smolikova, so let me to go straight uh, to our business. I'm really privileged and honored that I can uh, moderate uh, this panel, um, which is special because its uh, intention is to pay tribute and to honor our Laureate, the first winner of Václav Havel's uh, International Human Rights Prize. As you know, uh, Aleš Belatsky cannot be here with us for obvious reasons, being in jail. So we are really very happy and fortunate to have here a person uh, uh, that has been sharing the burden with him for so many years, courageous woman Natalia Pinchuk. Welcome here. Um, uh, and I'm very glad also that uh, we uh, organizers have decided in the end uh, to enlarge this conversation. I don't think that we should have interview rather friendly conversation. Uh, that the uh, conversation is uh, also uh, uh, enlarged by the presence of two other finalists or representatives of two other finalists. Uh, Georgian group Georgian Young Lawyers, represented by Kaka uh, uh, Kozoridze, and uh, the group from China Rights Defense Network, represented by uh, Teng Biao, who already spoke in the morning. Uh, before I give floor to them, let me, just in a brief introductory remarks, uh, to share with you a couple of my own experiences uh, as a member of international uh, selection panel uh, for this prize. It was a very interesting experience for me. First of all, what I need to highlight and stress is the fact that this is the endeavor in which Council of Europe or Parliamentary Assembly of Council of Europe, which means interstate entity, uh, combines its resources, power, with uh, non-governmental organizations, with uh, Charter 77 Foundation and Václav Havel Library. I think that this uh, connection speaks for itself, and I think that one of the messages we would like to send out from here is that the, this communication, uh, the efficiency of communication, the capability of dissidents, human rights defenders, to send message to interstate bodies it's uh, um, extremely important because they cannot do, I mean interstate bodies or states, 
cannot do work for human rights defenders, but they have certainly important and essential role of implementation of our uh, human rights policies and endeavors. Uh, we started with 27 uh, candidates, and uh, we then first uh, went through two rounds, shortlists, and then uh, end up with three finalists and winner. When I was just thinking about all these groups uh, and individuals, they were uh, presented as, as candidates. Obviously, first what I had in mind is that there will be one winner, but no losers. That uh, this was not a competition in a sense that uh, the best is going to win, and which means that the others are somewhat worse. It was our choice to uh, deliberately design the one who deserves the prize. And we all uh, had individuals with concrete personal stories and histories. And we have also groups, uh, uh, organizations. So we had to think uh, um, along the lines of individuals versus organizations. And when I was uh, thinking about that on the way, I realized that we can speak about almost taxonomy of different entities um, uh, within the civil society uh, that uh, come into consideration and also uh, that uh, correspond to our Central European Czech experience uh, yeah, uh, in this process. We uh, have uh, in front of us uh, some people, individuals, loose entities that reminded me our times during the Charter 77. Uh, these groups are not NGOs um, uh, in a typical form, because they operate uh, under the uh, stress of totalitarian, semi-totalitarian, or authoritarian regimes. We also could look at a different uh, type of civil society entities, uh, now uh, seen in, uh, uh, for instance, in Middle East and in uh, uh, the times of Arab Spring. These bodies that are formed and seen in action um, uh, fulfilling squares and formulating their uh, uh, demands in a very difficult and fast communications with governments. And we have third type of organizations, those who are part of the process of transition to democracy, uh, those who have, I would say, regularized status of NGOs, who need to be organized, financed well, and uh, uh, whose efficiency is obviously maybe uh, the matter of concern. Pavel Demesh spoke beautifully about the situation of uh, NGOs in the process of transition in different parts of the world. When I see uh, these three finalists here, uh, several other things uh, necessarily uh, have come to my mind. First of all, that each uh, entity like that be it individual or a group, comes with very specific point of view. Specific point of view uh, uh, because of the place they are coming from, the history uh, they are part of, culture uh, they represent, or religion, uh, also geopolitical situation, uh, and maybe there are some other factors. But there is this specificity in uh, uh, their message, their participation in these collective endeavors. So, and then there are uh, similarities and also differences. What are the similarities? What is the common ground of all these activities? I think that we can easily use the formulations that can be found in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We will be celebrating the 65th anniversary uh, very shortly of the adoption of this declaration. Uh, there are certain common standards of achievement, maybe understanding that uh, uh, goes across the cultures what we are up to. But they are very different and differentiated instruments of implementation. Obviously, interstate organizations, they have their own repertoire, their toolbox of instruments of implementation. I think NGOs uh, and individuals fighting for human rights have their own, and uh, I will uh, shortly give the floor to these three uh, um, personalities to give uh, us their own comments, their own 
um, uh, reflections on their own instruments of implement, implementation. And last thing I would like to make is the difference uh, that has been also mentioned here between, uh, let's say, our imprinting days, 1989, and the situation, and again I can just uh, follow up what Pavel Demes said, the situation in 2013, when we will be go going to, when we will be celebrating uh, very soon the 25th anniversary when this process in this part of the world started. The world has changed not only uh, in our context, but the world changed globally. The human rights struggle now is taking place in post-European world. We are not uh, anymore uh, uh, stricken or um, uh, too much attached to European form of universalism. We are looking, as Václav Havel liked to say, the common uh, uh, ground, uh, something we all can agree, uh, regardless our cultural origins, our uh, religious beliefs, only sticking to our humanity, to the fact that what we most likely agree is human dignity, respect for each human being as human being. With that, uh, I would like to ask first Natalia uh, to speak on behalf of her husband in jail and give us uh, the Belarusian perspective. Thank you. Natalia, you have the floor. Спасибо. Тяжело говорить от имени мужа, поскольку, понятно, границы нас разделяют, и, к сожалению, разделяют не только границы, но и стены тюрьмы, стены колонии, за которой он находится. К сожалению, вот эта ситуация, связанная с тем, что Алис находится в заключении, является не лучшей визиткой моей страны, моей Беларуси. И, к сожалению, вот общая ситуация в Беларуси характеризуется именно тем, что на сегодняшний день не только, не только Алис политически заключенный в Беларуси, там кроме него находится еще 10 человек. Это, да, это вызывает мое сожаление, как гражданки Беларуси. Понятно, что это не может волновать и сообщество, сообщество других стран, представителей других стран. Что касается... Эта ситуация, к сожалению, держится достаточно долго. Если измерять временем заключения Олеси, то это уже более двух лет. Некоторые заключенные находятся еще более продолжительные сроки. Впечатляют так само и те сроки, на которые осуждены люди. Максимальный срок доходит до восьми лет. Репрессиям подвержены люди всех возрастов. И, к сожалению, ситуация с правами человека в Беларуси не улучшается. К сожалению, это демонстрирует и события последних дней. Не скажу, что это ноу-хау белорусских властей, но так, также, вероятно, это опыт еще заимствованный со времен Советского Союза, это применение репрессивной медицины в отношениях тех, кто может высказать иную точку зрения что, или критиковать власть. Это касается и проблемы, связанные с смертным наказанием, с внесением смертного наказания. Если помните, со времени взрыва в метро, когда были вынесены два приговора и приведены исполнения, на некоторое время... Некоторое время было своеобразное затишье. Сейчас мы знаем, что в Беларуси опять выносят смертные, смертные присуды людям. 
Понятно, что эти аспекты жизни Беларуси находятся в поле зрения правозащитников. Понятно, что это важно и для самого правозащитного движения. Важно сказать, отметить и еще, чем характеризуется да, ситуация в Беларуси, к сожалению, и что иллюстрирует ситуацию с ухудшением положения в нашей стране и давлением на политических оппонентов и гражданское общество. На протяжении этого года мы наблюдали задержание и гражданских активистов, и политических активистов. Так сам, также можем сказать о том, что э, власти применяют и такие средства, как давление на семьи э, тех, кто... Э, кто имеет силу, кто имеет смелость высказаться или критиковать власть. Так у нас как раз в Беларуси произошел случай, когда дочь несовершеннолетняя одного активиста была похищена и вывезена в лес. Хорошо, что она осталась жива, но методы воздействия, как бы, они вырисовываются и тоже характеризуют достаточно сложную ситуацию в моей стране. Слушая здесь ваше выступление и вот представителей со стороны России, да, Нужно осознавать, что права человека, они универсальны. К сожалению, как и универсальные проявления тоталитаризма репрессивных режимов. И поэтому очевидным является необходимость дальнейшего, дальнейшей и поддержки гражданского общества и поддержки тех, кто занимается этим, если говорить в отношении Беларуси, достаточно небезопасной деятельностью. И еще, пользуясь уже моментом, хотела бы еще поблагодарить тоже всех тех, кто содействовали в организации этой, этой награды, кто проголосовал за Олеся. Именно это и, и Хартии 77, и библиотеки имени Гавала, и ассамблеи, ассамблеи Европейского Совета. И эта награда, она знакова в том плане, что она дает понять власти, что то, что чинится внутри страны, не остается без внимания за рубежом. И можно надеяться, что все совместные усилия дадут свой результат. Спасибо за внимание. Uh, I will learn to have one uh, follow-up question. Um, uh, I guess that uh, uh, Alex Bilatsky, your husband, already knows uh, about the uh, award, but you told me yesterday that you tried to communicate with him uh, from Prague, but that you ran into certain difficulty. Can you uh, tell us something about that? Да, приехавши в Прагу, первым делом я сразу хотела отправить телеграмму Олеся, но, к сожалению, здесь в стране технологии уже ушли очень далеко. Да, и когда я пришла на почту, мне сказали, что телеграмму здесь не отправляют, могут только факс. 
Ну, понятно, что факс в тюрьму Олесю не доставит. И, но, во всяком случае, когда мне уже предоставилась возможность говорить с моими знакомыми из Беларуси, то они меня успокоили тем, что телеграмму они туда отправили. Трудно сказать, передали ли сразу, сразу же эту телеграмму поздравительную в руки Олеся, потому что, вы понимаете, в администрации колонии может применять разные способы воздействия, в том числе и изолировать заключенного от той или иной информации. Но будем надеяться, что Олеся знает об этом. Okay, so let's go uh, to our two uh, other uh, panelists. Uh, uh, Georgian Young Lawyers Association um, uh, has been conducting human rights protection activities since 1994 in the following strategic fields, legal aid uh, to vulnerable groups, prisoners' rights, uh, especially attention is paid to the effect of torture and mistreatment, participation in legal drafting, raising awareness uh, in the area of rights, strategic litigation, protection of media interest. So, uh, 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 Kaka uh, Kozorize is a young man, uh, but uh, the association has a tremendous program and uh, significant achievements. Can you share with us uh, something, uh, what's happening now in your beautiful country? Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great honor to me to be here and to represent Georgian Young Lawyers Association. And of course, for Georgian Young Lawyers Association and every, for every founder and every, for every member of this organization, uh, for us, generally, it's very greatest honor to be shortlisted uh, in the Waslav Havel Human Rights Competition. Um, I think, and uh, I'll try not to be subjective, that uh, this organization really deserves uh, this honorary um, uh, status to be shortlisted in this uh, human, human rights competition. Uh, it's almost 20 years that uh, young lawyers are playing very active, active role in the democratic development uh, in our country and to promote human rights and rule of law uh, in Georgia. This organization was founded almost 20 uh, years ago by approximately 60 young lawyers just after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and uh, which was followed by several civil wars in the country, and uh, there were neither state institutions uh, nor civil society organizations in that time, and uh, those young lawyers in that chaos founded this organization. And uh, since that, uh, the organization plays play a humble role, I think, in the development process, democratic development process. And uh, mainly we are watchdog organization, uh, but it does not include to cooperate with government, or government bodies uh, with regard to human rights and rule of law. So we are also cooperate with them, but mainly we are um, watchdog organizations. During uh, these 20 years, we had numerous projects, uh, numerous uh, researches, um, and so on, but I think the main achievement which uh, I'm proud that the organization achieve is that and the fact that uh, in spite the fact that uh, in our country many things changed during these 20 years uh, government changes uh, 
many things are changing. We managed to uh, to defend and contain our uh, stability to uh, to defend our neutral, impartial uh, role and to be objective uh, and not be influenced by any kind of political or any other kind of influence. And uh, um, Mr. Martin uh, listed uh, several activities which we are provided and uh, for common Georgians our organization is mostly known as a human rights defender and uh, as uh, a provider of free legal aid service. We have one office in the capital of the country, in Tbilisi, and seven regional offices, and all our eight offices there are uh, free legal aid centers, and uh, every uh, person, in spite uh, if he is or she is a citizen or not of Georgia, can uh, come into our offices and get free legal aid service. And annually, you know, our lawyers who uh, are approximately 140 staff members right now uh, provided uh, legal as assistance uh, at, uh, several thousand, uh, several ten thousand uh, persons in Georgia, and uh, uh, we are handling strategic litigation. We are representing approximately 400 persons in the Euro European, European Court of Human Rights. Our main direction is to help uh, vulnerable persons uh, such as uh, disabled, sexual, religious, eth ethnic minorities, and political uh, ma and prisoners mainly, uh, which, because these, uh, the systematic uh, problems we had in our prison system during the last several years. Uh, one of our main direction is uh, to support court uh, judiciary reformation process and uh, uh, during uh, several years we had numerous researches and we are monitoring uh, court trials and after parliamentary election in 2012 uh, new government began uh, reformation process in our court system and uh, uh, it used our researches and uh, the, the Ministry of Justice proposed uh, drought law and mainly that drought law was based on our research, uh, researches. We also, you know, from our foundation, we are um, monitoring every election in local level and parliamentary and presidential election and uh, I think that uh, right now uh, the situation in Georgia with regard to human rights is improving and is getting better uh, if we regard the period of which we had um, several years ago. We really have big improvements, I think, but of course uh, problems still remain and some of them are acute, especially uh, the rights of sexual uh, and religious minorities and generally minorities are one of the hot debatable issues right now in Georgia. And it's uh, shortly about, short story about uh, Georgian Young Lawyers Association. Um, it's uh, great that uh, um, I want to uh, add a few words that um, uh, I think that it is great that uh, European Council and Parliamentary Assembly uh, uh, already the, the Human Rights Prize already had a name and the very honorary name was La Havel Human Rights Prize and uh, as I understand all of we, us here, uh, maybe we are participants of the uh, start of a very important, great tradition. Uh, I mean, 
that uh, the, uh, this competition will be a annual event and uh, I hope also the conference will be also an annual event and it will be a very important support from the European society not only for the shortlisted NGOs but all, also every single citizen uh, who thinks that uh, uh, human rights is most important challenge of the modern world and who thinks that democracy needs constant struggle and to say by the words of our uh, conference who thinks that freedom, freedom is not to be taken for granted. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and also just one uh, uh, question, quick question. How would you assess uh, the political, what would be your assessment of political context, political environment in which you operate? Uh, is it always friendly or hostile? Do, do you run often to some sort of conflicts? Do you have open uh, or maybe hidden enemies uh, in uh, uh, the context of uh, Georgian politics? Oh, uh, thank you for this question. Um, I think that um, uh, fortunately we don't have the same problems as uh, China and uh, Belarus. Uh, and uh, uh, the situation in this regard is, is much more better and I think our government is um, uh, trying to uh, take into consideration our evaluation, our uh, suggestions, and our criticism. And uh, for example, uh, after parliamentary election, uh, which we had in 2012 in October, we, uh, uh, several leading uh, non-governmental NGOs in Georgia organized uh, conference um, in February this year, and we decided to assess the first 100 days of the activities of the new government, and uh, you know, we invited uh, our uh, government, and uh, a lot of representatives uh, came there, including uh, prime minister and uh, several ministers and the parliament, uh, representatives from judiciary from High Council of Justice, and and uh, we are discussing the issues, what, uh, they, what mistakes they had, what achievements they had, and uh, we, we have improvement. But also it does not mean that uh, uh, they always uh, understand and share our values. We have, of course, uh, problems, and I think one of the most important problems is uh, to... to uh, reform to reform reformation of the um, um, uh, judiciary and uh, law enforcement bodies, especially uh, because the impunity was one of the most important problem in uh, uh, law enforcement bodies. And when we see now the problem with the uh, uh, regard impunity in the law enforcement bodies, we are very critical and. Um, of course, our new government don't like our don't er, uh, always like our criticism, and we had some uh, problems, but uh, not uh, no, like uh, no, not the same problems. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, you want now? Uh, I thought that we will open it to the question uh, uh, later. Uh, now, Rights uh, Defense Network, China. Uh, Wang Biao, uh, Teng Biao uh, has already spoken in the morning, but uh, now uh, he will put his uh, message to us into the context of uh, these three uh, panelists, uh, the finalists of the Václav Havel International Human Rights Competition. A couple of things that maybe is not known here. Uh, in the Czech Republic, many people now talk about economic relationships between the Czech Republic and China, and we have uh, uh, different associations to promote that. But uh, the fact also is that this Chinese group has been nominated to get this prize by also uh, Czech uh, 
um, uh, individuals and groups. First, what needs to be said that uh, the most uh, 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 the biggest voice was coming from people in it foundation, uh, Prague based operation. I see here Dana Nemcova, former spokesperson for Charter 77. She also uh, put her voice uh, uh, behind this uh, nomination. And we can also mention Václav Mali, auxiliary bishop of Prague, uh, also former spokesperson of Charter 77, who, was, uh, who is behind this nomination. So this is uh, maybe a very important uh, but not very well-known aspect of Czech-Chinese relationships in these days. Uh, then what I would like to say is, and maybe it is a specificity here, that in my view the Chinese uh, human rights defense is very much influenced by the dramatic change between 1989 and now, which means change uh, and revolution in uh, informational technologies. Uh, what I s read here in the nomination is that email lists uh, of uh, 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 this organization includes more than 100,000 addresses uh, in China that Chinese Google group has more than 9,000 members, that Twitter site has more than 20,000 followers, and uh, I can go on and on. Uh, so the question I would just uh, say right away, but you obviously will be free to say whatever you want to say, is whether this uh, revolution in uh, informational technology really has a serious positive impact how to struggle with uh, authoritarianism in China and to promote the protection of human rights. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman. Uh, um, uh, first, uh, uh, the nomination um, of the Wagner Howell uh, Human Rights Prize to our group, and also we uh, uh, we are given a, a diploma. I think it's a, a very clear message to uh, Chinese governments that. Uh, they, they should uh, respect and obey their own constitution and law. Um, and uh, uh, it's also a, a, a clear message to, to our human rights defenders that uh, uh, we are not alone. Um, and uh, uh, um, international attention and international support to the human rights uh, activities in, in China will not uh, stop. And first, I will give a very a brief um, introduction of the, uh, the, the change uh, in, in pol political system and the legal uh, system in China for the past uh, 60 years. Uh, in 1949, uh, uh, the communi Chinese Communist Party established a, a typical totalitarianism uh, regime. Um, during during that uh, uh, that period, um, uh, tens of uh, millions of people uh, died of uh, uh, political reasons. And uh, in 1976, uh, Mao Zedong died, and uh, the Cultural Revolution uh, ended. And uh, um, and then the, the, the central government issued a, a kind of uh, open policy. Uh, but only in in in, uh, in economics uh, and in a sh uh, to a certain extent in in uh, legal uh, system, and uh, <clears throat> and then uh, we all uh, know that uh, in 1989 the, the, uh, it happened uh, the, the Tiananmen uh, massacre uh, happened uh, when when the the, the, the uh, communist part communist. Uh, can, uh, states uh, collapse in in Soviet Union and uh, Eastern uh, Europe, um, and uh, um, and uh, um, then after the Tiananmen massacre, um, uh, uh, the the central uh, government uh, had to uh, continue its uh, its uh, open policy, uh, and uh, it's uh, recognized the uh, market economy. Uh, officially, and uh, it uh, uh, began some reform on our legal system. Uh, and uh, then, uh, since the end of 1990s, uh, internet appeared and uh, uh, it developed in China very rapidly. And then, we human rights lawyers, uh, human rights defenders, used the 
internet as a very important tool to to uh, uh, um, to fight for uh, human rights, to fight for uh, uh, democracy, um, and uh, the the uh, rights defense uh, network. Um, um, Includes uh, um, hundreds, thousands of human rights defenders in 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 China. Um, the, uh, uh, they are the uh, the uh, activists, uh, lawyers, bloggers, uh, journalists uh, who believe in nonviolent principles and and try to claim their uh, constitutional rights. They are activists who demand uh, equal education rights in, in big cities. And they are uh, lawyers who <coughs> defend the uh, freedom of expression, um, religious freedom, uh, the uh, freedom of association. Uh, in, in the trial process, they defend uh, uh, for Falun Gong practitioners, uh, underground houses, and uh, uh, Tibetan people and uh, Uyghur people. Um, and uh, they are uh, bloggers and uh, citizen journalists who disclose uh, corruption and uh, uh, forced abortion, uh, forced uh, eviction, and other uh, government violations of uh, human rights. Um, so we, uh, we are practicing the uh, idea of uh, the so-called organizing without organizations. And you know, to, uh, to uh, set up a, a political uh, party, uh, a political organization is, is very, very dangerous. You, you, you will definitely be uh, put into prison for a long time imprisonment. But we uh, human rights defenders uh, use the internet, use uh, mail list, Twitter, uh, Weibo, the tennis uh, version, Twitter, um, or Skype, you know, every uh, internet technology to uh, to uh, uh, to uh, is that to organize ourselves to um, uh, to discuss human rights together. So it's very uh, it's, it's very easy for us to to gather together. Uh, so I think your question is very good. Internet internet uh, plays a uh, very a vital important role in the human rights movement in, in China. So the, so the, the rights defense network is not an organization, it's a, a very loose uh, organization, it's a, a movement. And uh, uh, we have uh, thousands of uh, human rights defenders, some of them are in prison and uh, some of them are uh, on the way to prison. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to uh, close uh, this uh, part of uh, um, our uh, friendly conversation uh, by quoting uh, from Liu Xiaoba. I uh, liked, uh, uh, you, on internet you can find the speech he made uh, before the court when he was sentenced to 11 years in jail. Uh, and he uh, said so beautifully that freedom of expression is mother of truth. Uh, which is a subtle, I would say, Chinese uh, way how to uh, express something very important by free of expression. For us, it's not uh, something uh, that guarantees to us certainties of this or that kind, but it is a mother uh, which gives an opportunity that truth uh, can eventually uh, be revealed. And this is something what I think uh, all cultures uh, uh, share uh, the belief that true truth needs to be relieved from time to time if we don't want to live uh, in a total disarray and disorientation. I would like to open now uh, the floor uh, and just questions, comments. Franciszek. Thank you. Uh, I have... Uh, a question to our Georgian winner of the competition. Uh, I met the day before yesterday in Strasbourg the Speaker of your Parliament. 
and we exchange a few minutes uh, of conversation. Did he, what was his reaction to your selection uh, to this close, uh, uh, to this uh, uh, recipient of Václav Havel Prize? Did he comment it with you or did you speak with him? Uh, I would like to say that on the left side, the Chinese uh, candidate had produced a lot of worries by Chinese government. And we were with uh, Martin Palos, visited by Chinese consul general uh, in Strasbourg. He was trying to persuade us that everything is absolutely okay in China with human rights and it is no reason why to give the Václav Havel Prize uh, uh, to him. So it shows that the Václav Havel Prize is already important <laughs> prize. <laughs> and, but I would like to uh, listen to your comment. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this question. Uh, you know that, um, you may, uh, may not know that uh, our speaker of the parliament is the author to found the guy, author of the idea to found the, this organization 20 years ago. And also he served as the first chairperson of this organization. So uh, he was really happy that uh, our organization uh, was shortlisted. Uh, and uh, also I, I think would be much happier <laughs> uh, if, if he became prize winner uh, because I think that uh, you know, if uh, uh, one organization or a person became a prize winner, it does not necessarily mean that uh, that government in that country is very bad, I think. Uh, maybe uh, there is something connection in the, this uh, to you know, things, but uh, I think that it isn't, does not mean directly this. So uh, he was really happy. <laughs> uh, I just, uh, following up what Franjek has said, we had a really beautiful conversation the day before the prize uh, ceremony took place with the Chinese Consul General, and he came with uh, open uh, arms and a lot of friendly talk, uh, but uh, the strange Havelian absurdity was that in the name of this friendliness and like-mindedness, he asked us that his candidate not should be a uh, recipient of Václav Havel's prize. So uh, it was a very uh, absurd uh, uh, communication. But anyway, questions, comments? Is there any hand up? Oh, over there. Uh, I first see Alesh and then you, sir. Uh, Igor, sorry. Um, Igor, Igor Blažević, uh, I wanted to ask uh, our friends from the China if uh, um, he can tell us uh, what kind of the solidarity, let's say, the people from outside China can now give, let's say, to you and uh, to your colleagues, let's say, what we can concretely do and do you feel very lonely in your work or there are some things what the people from outside can do for you? Um, thank you. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, China is um, um, is in is uh, on the way of uh, democratization. Uh, or we 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 are trying our best to push forward the, the uh, uh, rule of law and uh, and democracy in in China. And uh, during this uh, process, uh, the the uh, Chinese people themselves are. Uh, the most important uh, element to, to change. But uh, international uh, community also is very, very uh, important. Without uh, international uh, support, we will face uh, uh, more and more uh, difficulties. And, uh, um, and uh, uh, we just uh, mentioned that the uh, uh, Chinese government gave a lot of pressure to, to the uh, 
uh, Václav Havel Human Rights Prize, and it also gave pressure to to United Nations, to the uh, UPR, to to EU, to uh, yeah, every every time uh, you want to 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 mention to discuss uh, human rights uh, in in China. Uh, but I think we should uh, also give uh, pressure to Chinese government because because uh, human rights freedom is not. Uh, is is uh, should not be uh, negotiable. It's it's the the, the fundamental uh, fundamental rights, fundamental dignity. So, uh, uh, at, uh, uh, in terms of um, uh, concrete uh, uh, suggestions, I think um, um, uh, international community, international uh, media uh, may. Uh, Pay more attention to the uh, the human rights uh, defenders and the dissidents, especially those uh, who uh, are in prison and who in uh, danger. Um, and uh, if you 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 grab the the information, and then you uh, you you may have the the good uh, good strategy. And uh, um, and uh, second, uh, I think uh, it's good to to uh, communicate with the real uh, society, uh, civil society in in, in China. Uh, um, for for, uh, for many many uh, conference uh, meetings, uh, the 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 so-called Gongo, the government organized uh, organizations or, or, or uh, official uh, scholars were. Uh, I were invited, so they they are not helpful. They just speak for for the dictatorship. Thank you, yeah. sir. Uh, Jeffrey Schott from Washington. Uh, this question is also for our uh, Chinese colleague. Uh, it's very uh, impressive on how you are using the internet. Uh, to advance your communications and organization uh, throughout China and around the world. And I wonder if it's possible, using the same techniques and technologies, uh, to uh, use those channels for fundraising. Uh, and is that possible uh, in China? And if it is, are there lessons that could be uh, learned from that experience uh, to uh, uh, transport to other countries uh, that ha have more restrictions? On the financing of uh, NGOs. Yeah, um, um, uh, to uh, to get uh, uh, foreign fundraising is uh, a bit dangerous uh, in, in China, but it also depends um, um, if the, the uh, human rights activists or NGO. Uh, uh, are focusing on uh, environmental protection or uh, the the the, um, the rights of the uh, disability uh, uh, disabled person or the the, the uh, women's rights or, or children's rights. It's it's uh, it's okay because it's not so uh, politically uh, sensitive. Um, but if, uh, like our NGO, uh, we uh, uh, we uh, uh, participate the the, uh, uh, the human rights issues such as uh, freedom of expression, religious freedom, Tibetan rights, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the death penalty, uh, the wrong, wrongful sentence of death penalty cases. It's it's sensitive, so it's it's uh, very dangerous for us to to take uh, foreign money. Um, and but but we but so I suggest to to uh, to have a, a flexible way to uh, uh, in terms of the financial support. Uh, for for example, we our organization cannot be registered uh, in the in the government. Uh, we are only a, a, a group, um, but we have a, a, a partner from from uh, uh, Europe and. Uh, and uh, uh, they can uh, support us. So it's, it's, so it, it's good to have a, fl a flexible uh, uh, way to, to, uh, to uh, uh, support the Chinese NGO. Thank you. I would, uh, okay, I see still one question after. 
Martina Pařísková, Amnesty International. I have a question for Natalie. Uh, Amnesty International uh, made a big campaign last year in uh, uh, November, December, uh, behalf of your husband. Uh, it was the part of a big uh, action, letter writing marathon. Now the Czech section of Amnesty International also has a big campaign for release of your husband. I don't want to just to uh, say that we are going good job, but last year we got a letter uh, from Alice that he was reading all the postcards he got uh, during Christmas and New Year's and that it made him happy. So I'm just uh, wondering if you have any news or update, if still this Amnesty International work and support of all people from all over the world somehow helps him maybe uh, if he has better conditions now or how does he feel? Thank you. Большое спасибо за вопрос. Предоставляется возможность как раз адресно высказать свою благодарность, потому что Amnesty International всегда активно помогает и организовывает те или другие мероприятия, в которые выявляют поддержку Олеся. Что, что касается вашей деятельности, то она очень действенна и эффективна. Алису в письма в большинстве случаев доходят и доходят и из рубежа и разных стран и, стран, и во время тех акций поддержки, которые организовывали вы. Иногда он специально и для меня присылал отдельные письма людей, чтобы показать, в какой форме они могут выявлять словесные или рисовать. И причем видно, что поддержку выявляют не простые граждане разных социальных групп, разных возрастов. И эта поддержка дает возможность ему выстоять и дает силы. Это я могу сказать даже по, по собственному опыту. По опыту мне очень тяжело вспоминать первый день, когда Олес был арестован. И после проведенных обысков, когда мы с сыном остались одни, в квартире. Вот это первая ночь ареста Олеси была самая страшная для нас. И, и потому, что произошло это событие, но еще было страшно именно потому, что не, не раздалось ни одного звонка. Это как бы образовался такой вакуум, пустота, которая ну достаточно сильно воздействовала, во всяком случае, на меня. И вот не случайно эта ночь молчания для меня показательна. И, следующий, конечно, следующий день все изменил. И изменила в первую очередь, что поддержка. Поддержка со стороны людей, со стороны Белоруссии, тех, опять же, простых людей, со стороны организаций, которые активно и звонили, приходили, говорили, организовывали возможные мероприятия, и все это дало возможность выдержать, должно, дало возможность устоять. И особенно сильна тоже поддержка и важна поддержка, которая исходит от других организаций, правозащитных организаций из-за рубежа. Это опять дает властям почувствовать, что проблемы острые для, для сегодняшней Беларуси, они находятся под, под должным влиянием. Но тут как раз вопрос интересен тем, насколько Олесю это помогает. Это однозначно очень огромная поддержка. И от имени Олеси я могу поблагодарить всех, кто ее оказывает, и ваши организации в том числе. Большое спасибо. Uh, thank you very much. I think that we have uh, run out of our time, and I just would like to remind once more the suggestion made by Pavel Demesh and approved by the previous panel that uh, the Minister for Foreign Affairs of uh, Belarus should be given a copy of uh, 
Alesh's uh, uh, price uh, to his uh, materials uh, w um, to meet uh, the European uh, Union next time. I would add one question. Shouldn't we eventually uh, have a letter or postcard to be sent from here, from this assembly, to Alesh Belatsky to greet him, uh, especially under this uh, occasion? But thank you very much for, for uh, your attention. Panel is adjourned. Thank you very much. And I would like to invite Mr. Jan Macháček, who will chair the last panel. Jan Macháček is a journalist, musician, and as I said, also chairman of the board of Václav Havel Library. And other panelists, Jeffrey Schott from the Peterson Institute, Min Konain from Barma, activist and dissident, very important one there, and Natalia Taubina from Public Verdict Foundation, Russia. Please come to the stage and take a seat. And uh, I would also like to invite Igor Blažević because uh, we decided in the last minute that we will expand the panel uh, with one more important man. Igor, uh, okay, he's coming, fine, perfect. So, uh, Good afternoon, and uh, before I introduce uh, again all the panelists, uh, let me just uh, say a few words uh, or sentences about this uh, panel. When we were uh, preparing the conference, we were uh, really thinking on, uh, on uh, preparing it on sustainable basis so that uh, we don't exploit all the uh, all the topics concerning human rights first year because we are planning to have this conference and this award uh, to organize it every year so uh, we decided we were thinking about specific which are the specific topics which uh, have to do with human rights so we were considering definitely a very up-to-date topic like nationalism and human rights, xenophobia and human rights. We were discussing topics like how a field of human rights has changed since 1970s and 80s when Václav Havel was a dissident and human rights activist or started to be, and etc., cetera, etc., cetera. So one of the many important uh, topics are tools of pressure which can uh, which exist out outside of these countries which are uh, suffering from uh, human rights uh, abuse. Uh, mainly, this panel will focus on uh, economic tools, obviously, and among these uh, economic tools, it will focus uh, mostly on economic uh, sanctions but there are other tools of pressure there are uh, which uh, uh, for instance can be considered boycotts of particular events there have been a discussion about boycotting uh, uh, for instance winter olympics which are happening in uh, russia next year but uh, with uh, no success apparently uh, just uh, it seems to me that uh, discussions about efficiency and, uh, and uh, productivity of uh, economic sanctions is 
has been very long. It lasted for decades, and uh, it seems to me that uh, it's a it's a topic which uh, uh, is definitely has always been very very interested, interesting and very uh, controversial. And uh, if one wants to apply economic sanctions, it's clear that it should be uh, considered like that. Uh, it should be like you need as much information as possible about a particular uh, country, about its social structure, about uh, about uh, private entrepreneurs in this con uh, country, about how the uh, distribution of income and distribution of services is arranged in this country how uh, much it is the e economy is controlled by the state, who's going to be profiting on the sanctions, what's going to be, uh, how much it will impact poor people and middle class, how much of it, it will impact uh, black market, etc., etc. All these things must be considered, it seems to me, country by country, uh, there is also obvious a um, uh, question of justice, uh, which uh, it seems to us that big countries sometimes uh, seem quite courageous to apply economic sanctions against small countries which are abusing human rights, but they would never consider economic sanctions against really big uh, countries and uh, uh, major economic players which sooner or later will even achieve perhaps like the size of the biggest economy in the world, like uh, which is a potential for of, of China, definitely. There is also an important question about what particular companies can do, and a lot of, uh, there have been attempts in the history that major corporations, for instance, were considering boycotting or closing uh, their investments or trade activities in particular countries. Uh, it's very interesting, a question of publicly traded companies because can they decide to boycott some particular market or are we absolutely naive in uh, thinking about this? And uh, especially the history of foreign investors in uh, Russia uh, is, uh, is very interesting even though it doesn't have to do directly uh, anything with human rights but it has to do with the fact that some of the corp foreign corporations are welcomed, some of, some of them are not and they, uh, they have to uh, more or less behave according to Russian standards. Uh, many corp Western corporations it seems to me are, even though there is no more communism in countries like Russia, it, it seems to me that uh, they are still fulfilling the, what uh, Lenin used to say about capitalists, that capitalists would sell, you, uh, sell us the rope on which uh, we will hang him later on, so that's how capitalists is stupid. So it seems to me that uh, even though there is no communism in Russia anymore, so it's still uh, in to an extent uh, apply. So uh, I would like to welcome on this uh, panel uh, Mr. Uh, Jeffrey Schott, uh, currently a fellow and researcher in the uh, Peterson Institute, which is one of the most prestigious uh, think tanks uh, in uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, uh, Mr. Jeffrey Schott was uh, all his life basically a specialist on uh, economic sanctions and its uh, efficiency. And uh, uh, he also was teaching on this topic at particular universities in uh, <clears throat> Princeton and Georgetown, etc. And he, he published many books and uh, publications which have to do with this uh, topic. Uh, then I would like to welcome uh, Igor Blažević, who, by the way, recommended us Mr. Short because he was very much inspired by his uh, essays and by his expert uh, writing uh, on this topic. And uh, I would like to uh, welcome uh, Natalia uh, Taubina. Natalia is... Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, no, uh, uh, <laughs> Natalia is uh, uh, definitely... Uh, a legend among uh, Russian uh, uh, human rights activists and uh, human rights researchers. She has been in the field uh, since uh, 1992 and uh, 
uh, currently she is uh, uh, in uh, the Public Verdict Foundation, which she set up in uh, February 2004. And uh, in her CV, you can read that the uh, <coughs> Public Verdict Foundation is its mission is uh, focused on creating an environment of intolerance toward any forms of arbitrariness in Russian society ensuring civilian oversight of law enforcement bodies and facilitating comprehensive reform of law enforcement system, etc. You can read all the details uh, yourself. And uh, lastly, I would like, like to introduce Mr. Minkon Naink, who is uh, one of the most important uh, guests of this uh, event. Uh, in uh, the New York Times described him as Burma's most influential opposition figure after Aung San Suu Kyi and uh, uh, he uh, also has been called one of the most uh, charismatic and important uh, activists of uh, student uprising against uh, Burmese military regime also he has been a veteran in his field he started in to be an opposition figure in 1988. Most of the time between 1988 and now he spent, unfortunately, uh, in prison. And uh, so uh, also uh, one of the important topics to be discussed about Burma is like uh, how Burma is, uh, has suffered from uh, or not suffered, how, uh, how Burmese regime was uh, behaving uh, under the pressure of economic uh, sanctions. Uh, Igor Blažević, uh, who all of you know, who, was, uh, who moved to this country after uh, the war, during the war in the Balkans, uh, was one of the bosses of uh, Men in Need, our prestigious uh, uh, NGO in, in this country. And he also started a uh, festival, uh, <clears throat> One World, uh, the biggest uh, festival on uh, films, or, or documentary films on human rights in the world. But uh, currently he is, as I understand it, also more or less involved in the uh, transition of Burma and he spends a lot of time in uh, Burma uh, himself. So, uh, First, I would like to uh, give a floor to Mr. Geoffrey Short, who, has, uh, who is this uh, prestigious uh, expert on the topic of economic sanctions. So, uh, please, floor, floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Jan. Uh, it's a great honor for me to uh, uh, be invited to participate in this uh, conference. Uh, I feel... Uh, quite undeserving of, of the invitation, uh, particularly given the distinguished panelists uh, uh, joining me uh, in this session and, uh, and the very uh, uh, distinguished uh, uh, speakers who have preceded us, uh, and especially, of course, uh, the recipients uh, of, of the Vaclav Havel Prize. Uh, yet, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, this is the homeland of my grandfather, uh, who was forced to leave the country 75 years ago and was never able to return. Uh, unlike many of the speakers uh, at this conference, I live in very privileged conditions uh, uh, in my society, uh, which is much improved from when, while I was growing up. Uh, the human rights situation, the civil rights situation is improved. Uh, uh, but thanks to the sacrifice of uh, members of my family and my fellow citizens. And so I have the luxury of just being able to study the tools uh, of trying to improve human rights uh, while not being a, a frontline soldier in the war. Uh, my work on sanctions uh, has taught me uh, a number of things. Uh, sanctions are an important tool of economic statecraft. Uh, they're always used in conjunction with other means, diplomacy, uh, uh, ra ranging from diplomacy to military action. And what you want to do is try to avoid military action. You want to achieve uh, change and reform through peaceful means. And sometimes you need something more than a diplomatic slap on the wrist. 
uh, or a discussion uh, in Strasbourg. You need something that, that gets people uh, to make more uh, fundamental decisions. Uh, and so uh, when we've looked at uh, the vast experience of uh, using economic sanctions, uh, human rights uh, cases uh, contain about 15% of the cases that we've studied of over 200 uh, in the past 100 years of, uh, of activity. Uh, we've, uh, we've reached a number of conclusions. Uh, I'm always asked, did sanctions work? Do they work? Uh, and uh, that, uh, that's the question usually asked uh, and posed in a very simplistic fashion as if sanctions were some magic bullet uh, that could resolve long-standing problems and halt abusive practices by their coercive force. Uh, on that black and white standard, sanctions rarely achieve their avowed goals. Uh, however, they do have an effect on the target country, and in a sizable minority of the uh, cases that we've studied, uh, they seem to have contributed at least to some partial reforms, uh, and in a few of the cases, total satisfaction of their stated goal. So it is not uh, fair to say that sanctions never work. Uh, uh, they can achieve some results or move uh, uh, policy in the right direction, but they have to be used uh, properly. Uh, unfortunately, in the human rights cases, sanctions have generally failed to, uh, to achieve the desired results in, in almost all of the ones that we've, we've studied. That doesn't mean they haven't had an impact. Uh, cases themselves help to focus a spotlight on repressive policies and practices. Uh, and much like this very distinguished prize, hopefully will do so, and so that more in the world uh, community will realize what is going on in Belarus. Uh, this was the reason Jimmy Carter uh, focused much of his uh, uh, foreign policy uh, in the 1970s uh, with regard to Latin America on advancing and promoting human rights. Uh, I was with Jimmy Carter, who's now 88 years old, uh, just a few months ago. He was stopping off in Washington on his way to Burma uh, to, uh, per, uh, for... for uh, one of several uh, trips he has had in Burma uh, this year. And I asked him about, uh, well, was your policy of promoting human rights a failure? And he said, it didn't achieve the results I wanted while I was president, but it, has, it, it, it put a spotlight on the problem, and it led more and more people to address the problem in Latin America, and there have been improvements in human rights in Latin America as a result. He thought, putting an emphasis on human rights in U.S. foreign policy was the right thing to do, and it ended up having a positive result over time, though it didn't help him politically. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's an important consideration. Uh, another thing and another concern we have about uh, using sanctions is that they impose costs on the targeted country, uh, and, uh, but when you impose costs on a repressive autocratic regime, uh, the leaders of that regime generally can deflect the costs and hardships away from themselves and their main supporters uh, and uh, have, have the costs really borne by the general public. So there are a lot of innocent victims. Uh, this is, this is uh, a real problem uh, in societies. It's a problem that uh, is not well dealt with by the people who impose the sanctions uh, because they know they are cutting off sources of funding, sources of supplies to groups that they actually want to encourage in the country. People who are <coughs> NGOs who are promoting uh, who are dealing, uh, providing goods uh, and uh, medicines uh, to help needy members of those societies sometimes find it difficult to get the funding for uh, their, their activities because of, of the sanctions imposed uh, against the repressive regime. So there's a need uh, and an attempt to impose smart sanctions, targeted measures at political leaders and leadership groups, uh, measures such as freezing their assets uh, overseas, banning their travel um, uh, outside of their home country.
But generally, such people are not jet setters. Uh, and they stick close to home and their power base. And these types of smart sanctions are mostly nuisance measures, uh, though they do send signals of disapproval. Uh, but they need not smart sanctions, but smarter sanctioners to recognize that if an action is going to have symbolic reasons, it should have uh, um, minimized the cost to the groups within, within the society. Uh, so that the burden isn't deflected to the poor people, so that <coughs> medicines and, and, and uh, assistance can be provided to NGOs operating within the societies, uh, which is now actually becoming a little more easier because the Internet makes it more difficult to track the source of funding. Uh, and uh, uh, the use of Internet technologies certainly is improving communications and could perhaps be used more effectively by the sanctioning countries. So I, I know our time is short, and I actually want to hear more of the other members of the panel so I can learn more. But let me conclude with a, um, a couple of points on, on, on using sanctions more effectively, because you want to use sanctions, because the alternative policy responses are probably either ineffective uh, uh, or, or too drastic. Uh, you want to ensure that sanctions shine a very sharp spotlight on the abusive practices. Uh, the more publicity, the more attention, the more diplomatic noise, the more international meetings uh, uh, that focus on the actions, even if the action is symbolic in its economic content, it can have a very important political impact. Uh, <coughs> to maintain isolation of these regimes, uh, and that, that is uh, an important uh, element, isolating the leaders from uh, the main elements of the international community. And third, the sanctions can be used not just as a stick, but also as a carrot. And we're seeing this now in the case of Burma, where the unraveling of the sanctions, the removal of the sanctions, can be used as an incentive to maintain the reforms, uh, to, to pursue the reforms and to maintain and accelerate the pace of the reforms. This is something sanctions uh, 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 architects did not think about when I started uh, in this business and I was imposing sanctions against the Soviet Union uh, 40 years ago. Uh, but it is a very important part of economic statecraft and one that should be used uh, to support the very important work that uh, many of the speakers of this program have been pursuing for a long time. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, I would like to ask now uh, Natalia uh, to uh, continue on this topic. Uh, and uh, perhaps she should also uh, touch the topic of uh, Olympics, but not obviously like the, you can speak on whatever you want, but I would love, love to know your opinion on the Russian Winter Olympics and uh, what do you think about the failure to, uh, of the Western countries to be even interested in uh, considering some kind of boycott uh, thank you, and uh, thank you very much for the inviting me for such an important conference and the possibility to talk. Actually, the topic I'm supposed to talk about is uh, kind of unusual for me, because uh, in most of the cases uh, we are talking about uh, different aspects of uh, human rights uh, problems, uh, uh, how and uh, what can be and should be done in order to improve the situation. And of course, outside pressure and uh, different tools are always about steps we are planning to do in order to achieve improvements. But uh, quite uh, rarely they think uh, what kind of outside pressure is effective or not. Uh, usually we are aimed to use uh, any possible ways of outside international tools which potentially can be influence the situation at home. Uh, now we have very good opportunity to think and discuss uh, which tools are most effective. 
And I would like to say that tools can be roughly divided in three categories, economical, uh, uh, political, and legal. And of course, in many cases, a uh, mixture of um, different tools uh, is having place. And more <coughs> often, it's about legal and political ones. Uh, I would like to speak uh, based uh, on the experience of my organization, which is Public Verdict Foundation. And in our work, we first of all uh, use legal tools of international pressure to improve situation in Russia. Um, our organization for many years uh, have been involved in coordination and preparation of uh, alternative reports to the different uh, UN human rights treaty bodies. And I should say that we managed to produce reports of good quality, well verified. We are always, uh, uh, when we are thinking about the strategy, what to do with these reports, uh, we are uh, always uh, trying to create step-by-step -step, uh, strategy in order to achieve the best delivery of our message uh, to, to the committee members. And as a result, we quite often achieved our recommendations to be included uh, in the final documents of the committees. But then, with uh, very little exceptions, these recommendations are not implemented by Russian Federation. And I believe there are two main reasons for this. The recommendations are recommendations in their nature, so they are not legally binding, and there are no automatic sanctions for not implementations of these recommendations, except of political pressure. But uh, it's uh, very difficult to reach agreement among different political actors to create political pressure. Uh, because of many different factors and contradicting and sometimes contradicting interests of different parties. And the second reason is that we and Joes are not enough equipped and skilled in following implementation of uh, these recommendations and demanding our authorities uh, to fulfill them. And the similar situation exists with the Universal Periodic Report. We are again quite good in producing reports, negotiating with missions, explaining them main concerns and problems in human, in human rights area, even suggesting them questions uh, to be asked during the consideration of Russian Federation report uh, and recommendation to be made. And as a result, we have good questions raised by the missions, good recommendations suggested by the mission states, then Russian Federation decides which recommendation to adopt or reject. And as usual, the most sensitive and most strong recommendations are rejected by our government. For example, when we went through the uh, second cycle of the UPR uh, during spring session of this year, uh, the huge concern about uh, crackdown on civil society in Russia was raised during this process, and a lot of very good recommendations uh, were made by the states. As a result, Russian Federation rejected all recommendations <coughs> where words foreign agents been mentioned. Uh, what to do in this situation? what our strategy could be, and do we have uh, chances to influence these processes, uh, to make it more stronger? There are other questions, I mean, this is the questions uh, I would like to discuss us during this session. Uh, from our experience, the most effective outside, mechanism, outside legal mechanism is the European Court of Human Rights. First of all, because of its uh, legally binding, states are obliged to implement European court judgments, and this is a window of possibilities for us uh, to achieve systematic changes in the human rights area. Uh, we in Russia uh, have a lot of very good courts judgments, emphasizing systematic problems with the observance of human rights and obligations uh, Russia took 
uh, when uh, ratified the European Convention of Human Rights. We even have pilot judgments uh, in which it's clearly said Russia needs to make systematic changes, not to do just uh, something on particular cases. What we have usually in practice, Russia pays compensation in time and this is not a problem, implement individual measures in some cases and quite rarely does anything in terms of general measures. I must say that there is one clear exception, implementation of pilot judgment. Here Russia tries to demonstrate goodwill and implement general measures. So clear conclusion here is to have more pilot judgments on different issues. But uh, this procedure is quite new and happens not often. But if to say, in, uh, if to talk in general, why implementation is uh, not full? Why it does not bring us uh, to improvements? Uh, to my opinion is that control for implementation is taken by the political uh, body, by the com com Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe. And even having a new procedure which allows uh, to return the case which is not implemented to the court for the new consideration, this procedure has not been used at all. Why? Uh, because it's needed the agreement of two-thirds of countries who are part of the European Convention to start this procedure for particular cases. Last example I would like to mention uh, concerns the situation with the crackdown of civil society in Russia. Uh, in uh, the morning session, uh, we already heard from uh, Mr. Verkhovsky more details about uh, uh, what difficulties civil society is uh, facing now and has been facing since uh, last year. Um, now one can say that we have a period of freezing. Authorities admitted that law needs to be changed. Many court hearings are constantly postponed and uh, Alexander already uh, mentioned several reasons why we are in this situation right now. I just, I agree with, with everything he mentioned, uh, but would like to add two, from my point of view, main reasons why they have uh, a kind of freezing period uh, right now. The first reason is that uh, is a consolidated uh, um, position of Russian society to reject, to boycott this law. And the second reason um, is a strong and open pressure from outside, political pressure from outside. Uh, we have uh, very good statements made uh, by uh, Special reporters, UN special reporters, we have a very good conclusion made by the uh, High Commission on Human Rights of the Council of Europe. We have a number of statements uh, made by different countries and altogether this pressure, to my opinion, uh, influenced the situation and uh, created a possibility uh, for the period of um, freezing. And, uh, I would like to express my hope that civil society in Russia has future as long as uh, these two reasons continue to be effective. And actually, I was not planning to talk about Olympic game and boycotting Olympic game, but uh, uh, to, to, to answer on your question, uh, it's a I mean, it's, a, it's a difficult question and there are a lot of discussions uh, on uh, what to do and how to use uh, uh, the coming Olympic game and we have experience of a uh, uh, campaign against Olympic game in China in 2008 and uh, uh, all this uh, different experience of uh, <coughs> sorry, using such a big uh, internet 
world uh, events in order to somehow influence human rights situation in different countries. Uh, I would say that for sure Olympic game should be used to attract more attention to the human rights problem in Russian Federation. And uh, there are different opportunities uh, to use uh, this uh, um, uh, this future event. Uh, for example, uh, just uh, last, uh, a few days ago, uh, during the meeting of one of the international platforms, human rights platform called the Civil Solidarity Platform, which unites human rights NGOs uh, from uh, different European countries, uh, we discussed uh, to create a special section, of, for example, on our website, uh, which is quite good uh, visiting by internet users uh, and saying simply that there are uh, 60 days before the Olympic game and there are these problems uh, with human rights in Russia. On the next day there are 59 days uh, before the Olympic game and still human rights problem in this and that area continue to exist at something like that. Uh, but uh, um, about boycotting the Olympic game, I would say that uh, uh, makes sense uh, trying to receive agreement from the authorities not to come for Olympic game. I mean, the sportsmen can do uh, the competitions during the uh, Olympic game because it's not about the politics, but the authorities, the diplomats, uh, could express their concern with the human rights situation in Russia by, it, by not coming to the Olympic game. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, <laughs> now I would like to uh, give a floor to Mr. Minkon Nang, who expressed interest not to speak specifically about sanctions but about sit, uh, to uh, introduce us to the situ current situation in uh, Burma, if I understand it well. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Please allow me to explain a bit of the history of Burma. It is different from Eastern and Central Europe. In Eastern and Central Europe, the changes were political. Actors in both were politicians in our country. Main characters are the army. Politicians will look at things from political point of view. But military will always give excuse of security. Now, I would like to explain about our current situation. How are we going to understand the transition in Burma, a country also known as Myanmar, that has been under successive military regimes for about 50 years? I'm not sure where it will go, but what I'm sure about is that as of today, it is nothing more than a transition from the right military rule to so-called disciplined democracy, in which the military or its surrogates still hold power. But I'm sure about what we need to do we need to begin to institutionalize ourselves and ask all civil society organizations to do so at the same time. Having been dominated by the military for so long, our society is used to following orders where obedience of all else is rewarded. For democracy to take root, we need to change society. That's why we dedicate our daily work to educating the people to understand their rights 
as well as to take responsibility and accountability for what they do. It is already beginning to show result. People are uh, beginning to speak out about the injustice they suffer on a daily basis, whether from government authorities or cronies. Despite the continued risks, they are also beginning to organize to fight for their right. But we need our society to do more than demand rights. That's why our slogan is reopen your eyes, ears, and mouths. People should not try to ignore unfair events happening in their uh, lives or in their neighborhoods. Like before, and they should open their eyes to see clearly this unpleasant action. They should open their ears to hear and listen to the cries of thousands of unfortunate people. They should open their mouths to denounce injustice, console the abused, stop abuse and demand justice. Uh, they are our message which we carry forward in our countless travels across the country. Uh, subsequently, many people come to us to expose their uh, suffering and to get our assistance to demand justice. We listen to their uh, cries. We encourage them to stand up to fight the giants and we help them to seek justice. On the other side, we have started to engage with the authorities who rule the country. Instead of talking about impacts of sanctions during the rule of military regime, I would like to talk about the impacts of lifting, lifting uh, sanctions. I agree that it encourages the process of political reforms, but I am concerned uh, that the role of democratic forces will become less important and be neglected. To impose a sanction requires a lot of time and efforts. Now, sanctions have been lifted and the international community is cooperating with the uh, Burmese government. In case the process of political reform is not for the sake of people in our country, I would like to ask you, what is your plan B? Meanwhile, we continue our hard work to support the spirit of democracy in Burma. To do this, we still need your kind cooperation and generous support. Today we need. Today we need to build capacity and strengthen CSO, civil society and to institutionalize structures, to train them to become more professional, including the army, to, next, uh, to, to network with international groups and organizations like this conference, to share and learn from each other's experience. At the same time, we need to strengthen the network of our democratic forces inside our country. Jikui <laughs> Bang. Thank you very much. And uh, now I would, I would like to ask uh, Igor Blažević to, he's made many uh, uh, 
remarks on his I always make mistake, uh, remarks that I can't read after myself, <laughs> so it doesn't help me really. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, before uh, going into the topic of this panel, uh, let me just uh, express uh, uh, how uh, proud I am on my Czechs. I'm not Czech. I'm, I'm, I'm Bosnian. I'm a, I'm a foreigner living in this country for already 20 years. And uh, I always become a little bit more Czech uh, when I see how this country is uh, welcoming warmly with the support and with the understanding uh, people like we have seen uh, on this panel today. Uh, there are not so many places around the world, I'd say, where uh, at the same day, at the same moment, there will be people from China, people from Russia, people from Belarus, from Burma, from Azerbaijan, I'd say, who will feel and be honored with the full respect I say, uh, for struggle, what they are doing uh, in their country. So I, I really want to give my gratitude, I say, to my Czech friends for continuing, I say, this legacy, which has been in a big extent started by the Havel and the people around Havel, I say, and then there are still people who are continuing that. I must say that I re regret a little bit, I say, that uh, 20 years ago, we have been welcoming those people on a Prague, in a Prague castle. Now, already 10 years, we are not doing that, or maybe even a little bit longer. Let's say, but I'm grateful that even if we can't, let's say, welcome those people already 10 or I don't know exactly how many years in a Prague castle, we can do it a little bit further away, probably 500 meters away, in another castle which is called Loretansky Castle, which is the seat of the, of the Czech Foreign Ministry. And, uh, and I am gratitude to the Czech Foreign Ministry that is continuing this tradition. But I am also really very, very happy, let's say, that even if there will be a moment when we can't bring those people to the Loretansky Council, which might happen, Let's say there will be a strong civil society in this country. Let's say which will welcome those people in a, in a pr uh, Prague crossroad, which will welcome them in a, in a Joffin Palace, in a, a Langhans Gallery, and uh, other places. I really feel, let's say, honored that let's say, people like Minkonan, for whom we have been demonstrating 20 years in this country, let's say asking for his release, that we can finally welcome he, him in Prague. And I hope i say that uh, the time will come, and rather soon than later, when we will be able to welcome in this city again Alex Bialitsky, and we will be able to welcome in this city uh, Liu Xiaopo. Uh, now, coming to the topic of the, of the, of, of the sanctions, let's say, I, I accepted to come to this floor uh, in a certain way to do uh, self-criticism. So I'm uh, already 20 years human rights activist, so, or, or I like to call myself democracy foot soldier. And for a really long period of the time, as a, as a many foot, sol foot soldier, I was following obediently some commands. So I can't, let's say, I... I and the command has been, let's say, let's campaign for the sanctions. Sanctions in Cuba, sanctions against the Serbs because of the war in Bosnia, sanctions against the Myanmar military regime for the crackdown in a, in a, in a 88, crackdown <coughs> in a 90, crackdown in a 2007, and so on. So, so really many times I was myself let's say, organizing other people, organizing public opinion and calling and saying, let's say, sanctions, let's do sanctions. That is the silver bullet which will solve. And I now, let's say, already 10 years, the next 10 years of my life, I started to be among us human rights activists, kind of the skeptical voice. 
and saying, hey guys, we haven't done, done our intellectual homework. And so then when I discovered the let's say, studies and work of the Peterson Institute, and I have started to do my, let's say, intellectual homework, and I'm using now that, let's say, to warn the, let's say, activists, campaigners, let's say, around me to say, hey, let's think a little bit more thoroughly before we start to call, let's say, for the, for the sanctions. So I'm still not expert. I'm still kind of the foot soldier, and I'm pretty busy with being foot soldier, so I don't have enough time to read and to, and to, and to think. Uh, but my really humble kind of the thinking which I'm putting as the argument in our discussions is, first, if we talk about sanctions, you know, let's not talk about sanctions like one size fit the all. Let's ask ourselves which sanctions we are really talking about, which countries we are talking about, what is really the purpose of the sanctions, what is the real context of the countries we are thinking about. And, and I must say in many, many cases, let's say kind of the we activists have been quick to call for the questions without really, let's say, answering and thinking thoroughly about these questions of what is really the purpose, what is really the context, and so on. So first thing, let's say. The second thing is uh, I realize, and it took me time, I'm, I'm a really slow learner, uh, I realized that in a number of occasions, we basically use either sanctions or humanitarianism, or very often both, as a replacement for the effective policies. We can't do anything. <laughs> but we are, we, in a democratic West, our public opinion, a media coverage of the horrors happening somewhere else are making a pressure on us to do something. I can always, for me, it's always the first thing that jump in my mind is horrors in my own Bosnia during the war in Bosnia. When, when you face the horrors of ethnic cleansing, of concentration camps, of the war, I say, then you want to do something. Or you, when you face the horrors of the military dictatorship in Burma cracking down through the brutal violence, the peaceful demonstrating monks. Then you want to do something, and because of this media coverage, let's say there is a public demand to do something. And very often, let's say, then we very quickly jump in that, okay, let's do humanitarian aid in Bosnia, or let's do, let's say, the sanctions here and there, without really asking ourselves whether in this specific context, let's say, that will help in any, 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 any way. Uh, I, this is the second point I want to, to make. Let's say we should be really very careful not to use the either sanctions or humanitarian aid as a replacement for the let's say, effective, uh, effective policies, like kind of the really washing our hands and saying, okay, we have done something, we can't, let's say, do more. It's really much more about, let's say, and it has been mentioned about the gradual, sustained, focused, concentrated policies, not just kind of the wash the hands and say, okay, we have done it. Let's say now it's on its own. <coughs> uh, the next thing, let's say, what I learned is that we very often, and now when I say we, I mean, let's say, the campaigners, the activists, but even more, I mean the people who are the victims. Let's say, trapped in the middle of the war, trapped in the middle of the dictatorship. We expect wrongfully from the sanctions something what they can't deliver. <coughs> and then we waste so much time our pressure activist time. We risk so much to campaign for something which cannot deliver what we want. Uh, because at least in the cases when I have been involved, let's say, we basically really passionately campaigned. Let's say in a moment when we have been faced with the horrors of the war, when we have been faced with the mass violations of the human rights, 
I say, and when we have been faced with a, with a kind of the really brut brutal side of the dictatorships, and when we have campaigned for the sanctions, we basically believed that the sanctions can stop the war, that the sanctions can stop the mass human rights violations, and I learned later on that they simply can't. That we try to apply the wrong medicine, let's say, for the, for the something what we wanted to heal. So, so this is another thing that when, when I'm trying to do it, because I'm mainly working with the people who are trapped in a war, who are, who, are, who are trapped in a horror of being afraid that tomorrow somebody will come and kill them as a whole family. Uh, uh, I'm working with the people who are afraid that probably they will say something today and then tomorrow, let's say, they will pick up and put in a, in a black jail in a China because they said something tomorrow. Let's say, so, so what I am trying now to say to those people, hey, hey, don't expect that kind of the sanctions will do the regime change. They will not. Don't expect, let's say, that the sanctions will stop the mass human rights violations because they will not. When they are imposed, probably human rights situation will, for a certain period of the time, become, become worse. Uh, so, what I kind of the really, as a, as, a, as a kind of a amateur in all, all these things, what I learned, let's say, the sanctions are really not useful too for the regime change policies. So if you want to regime change, let's say, let's look into the another tools, sanctions will not really help us. They will not stop the human rights violations. But yes, let's say, sanctions are good as a bargaining tool. Let's say, if you have all of these sanctions, so they, they have been imposed. And then if you have a very concrete, not open-ended demand for the freedom and democracy, but if you have a very concrete demand, let's say, to get somebody out of the, of, of the jail, or to, 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 then, let's say, they can work. But they can work only if on the side of the, of the, of the, of the group of the country which are ready to impose the sanctions, let's say there is a really focused, gradual, or, or focused, concentrated effort to implement the gradual increase of the pressure, and then the readiness to do the effective graduate decrease of the, of the pressure if they achieve very concrete, very specific, de, uh, very specific demands. Uh, Ne just a few more, few more things, and then I will stop. Uh, another thing, what, what I started to be, why I started to be suspicious, I realized that we don't really impose, <coughs> impose we as a West don't impose effective sanctions if uh, our core, hardcore interests are not in danger. When our hardcore interests are endangered, like, for example, in the case of the, of the nuclear program in Iran, then we know how to do that. But when it's not about our hardcore interests, but it's about lives and rights of the others, far away others, then we usually do it half, halfway. And halfway, it's, it's worse than, 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 than nothing. So in a certain way, again, we, we campaign a lot to impose them, but probably where we will get is just halfway, because there are many other interests in our society which will block us to doing it, uh, doing it uh, uh, properly. So for that reason, then, basically, let's say, I say, no, let's not do it, because anyhow, we will do it halfway. Uh, three more things what I wanted, let's say, kind of the, to share with you. Let's say we have a, when imposing the sanctions, we have a serious communication problem. Because you impose the sanctions, but you can't really, or usually in these repressive uh, uh, systems, you can't really communicate with the dom domestic population. As now with the internet, we are a little bit better. But still, let's say, the domestic public opinion is controlled by the majority of the people, are controlled by the repressive regime. So the, the sanctions are so easily used for the, as a propaganda tool for the regime to influence the, the people, and we should always be aware that sanctions are profoundly unpopular among the general population in the countries which are, which are hit. So we are in a certain way giving quite a number of the, of the, of the, of the tools for the regime and the, for the propaganda of the regime. The second thing, let's say, uh, 
imposing sanctions is creating one big problem which we usually don't talk about and we don't think about. Imposing sanctions is usually creating the mafia structure within the security apparatus of the targeted countries. Particularly, the sanctions last long. Let's say then the significant segment of the security apparatus of that country will start to behave, let's say, as a mafia illegal businesses uh, o- operation. Let's say because they need for the, to do for the state all these illegal economic functions, which they can't do normally. Let's say if there, be, there, there are no there are no sanctions. So in a moment that even if you achieve the change in a country, what you have, you have basically the secret police and part of the repressive apparatus who have used to behave for already five, ten years as a, as a mafia. And then it's so hard to dismantle that. I, we know it, I know it very well from Serbia, how, how, how hard it is, let's say, basically to dismantle the mafia structures from within the Serbian secret and military, military, military structure. And this is one of the kind of the negative consequences which I want to warn. Even if sanctions helps now for something, we create a serious problem for the next 20 years. And the last thing why I started to be a little bit suspicious about kind of the sanctions, although I agree, let's say, there are certain specific occasions where they, they can work and we should not disband them completely, but in a certain way, in a particularly in the current world, or, or, or kind of this multipolar world which, you know, we, the West pulls out. China immediately jumps in, Russia immediately jumps in. We have all these regional ambitious powers, Saudi Arabia, uh, Iran, others. Let's, you create the void. As somebody said, let's say in the Middle East, let's say you pull West House, uh, la, la, what is the name of the for, uh, Russian foreign minister? La, 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 Lavirov is immediately coming, coming in. Let's say. So you create a void. The void is immediate, is created by the non-democratic, let's say, uh, powers with enough money today and with enough influence to do it, let's say. So, so in that particular context, uh, I, I, I really, it's, it's so clear that battle for the freedom and rights is a domestic one. It's not international, it's not sanctions and so on. We can help a little bit. And, and for that reason, I'm much, much more now in favor of let's say, really Havelian uh, tradition of speaking the truth with, with, the, with the repressive regime, let's say, and, 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 and insisting on a kind of the engage and be the transparent in your engagement, let's say, engage, let's say, because, you know, there are 1,000 reasons why you will engage anyhow, let's say, but then don't engage only with the economy, don't engage only with the regime, but at the same time really stubbornly engage and stand by, let's say, the, the, the people who are struggling for the freedom and democracy in their countries and are taking a, a, a huge risk, let's say. So if I need to kind of simplify, I'm now, let's say, much more in favor of saying, let's be very careful with the sanctions, but let's not be careful in any way. Let's say, let's be like, like, like Pavel has said, let's be very strict, very firm in standing by, let's say, the people who are struggling for the freedom and rights in their countries, let's say, let's support, let's support them, let's say, in all different, let's say, small and big ways, what we can do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Since uh, Mr. Schott has uh, traveled from uh, the U.S., which is pretty far, like so, uh, I, w- I won't uh, let you to be so short and quick. So you will have to add a little bit more. You mentioned uh, uh, something about like that t- sanctions should be targeted. Could you give us like examples of targeted sanctions which might might be? F- effective under certain circumstances and also I would like to know your opinion about particle sanctions how did you evaluate American sanctions against Cuba which I think is exactly what Igor mentioned that by the way they call them Cubans themselves uh, call these sanctions uh, or their regime calls these sanctions like blockada so uh, it sort of strengthened this attitude that the Cubans, like a nation, survived in uh, 40 years of blockade, and they are, uh, they are the pop- general population is maybe more willing to for, to undergo some suffering because they are 
they are surviving the blockade. And uh, what, uh, are, what do you think about targeted sanctions to uh, Lukashenko's regime, mainly traveling uh, abroad to the EU, North Korea perhaps, some specific uh, countries? <coughs> Well, first I should say that you have heard an excellent summary just now of 30 years of work that my colleague and I have done on economic sanctions, and I think you have distilled the lessons very well from that, uh, from, from that analysis. Uh, so it, the analysis is not don't do sanctions, but think carefully about how to do it uh, don't do it, uh, avoid uh, unnecessary costs or collateral damage uh, to uh, people that you want to, to help. And, uh, and in doing that, you really need to think not of a sanctions policy, but of a policy cocktail, I would call it, where you have a mixture. You have some, uh, if you can't uh, expect a change, the, the economic measures to change, you want to mix symbolic actions that shine a spotlight so that the world sees the abuses, along with targeted assistance to groups uh, in the country, as you were saying, uh, to support the continued uh, uh, resistance, to strengthen, as our, uh, as our colleague from Burma said, the uh, network of democratic forces. Uh, you need to take those actions, positive actions, uh, not just punitive actions. So think of policy cocktails, a mixture of, 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 of measures on which the economic sanctions are, are not the traditional, we're going to punish you and take away your trade and finance, because in a world of, uh, of globalization, <coughs> there are many other countries that will be able to step in and provide that, uh, uh, those goods, those services, that finance. Uh, that's, that's part of the problem of, of the current age. Now, in targeting sanctions, what I mean is you have to match the expected results of the economic measures to the costs that will be imposed by, the, by those measures, both on elements in the society so that you don't hurt NGOs that are trying to help people by cutting off their funding, as is occurring in Iran right now, uh, so that uh, uh, you uh, basically don't encourage the type of concentration of economic activity in the society uh, by forces. As in Iran, uh, the uh, military is now becoming the owners of most of uh, many important means of production in that economy. Well, if there is a change and an opening up in Iran, there will be a serious problem of deconcentration. Uh, and so this mafia uh, uh, analogy, I think, is a very, very in important one. Uh, the the uh, final point, uh, and and I guess I I, I skipped over in, in 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 trying to have a very brief introduction of of of, of the of the issue of sanctions, is uh, uh, sanctions will be used by autocrats for their own purposes, and so you do have a rally around the flag response in the general public uh, when it looks like the misery that they are suffering uh, writ large because of economic distress is caused by external forces instead of the, uh, the repressive policies of the leaders of the country. And that's what Fidel Castro did for decades in Cuba. And so he maintained an element of support in his own society, uh, particularly when he was getting a very substantial economic support from the Soviet Union. And that enabled him to survive even though uh, he was only 90 miles from uh, the uh, U.S. border. Uh, now the United States is one of the few countries in the world that is imposing major economic sanctions against Cuba. It's a policy that many of us uh, thought had outlived its usefulness, usefulness 30, 40 years ago. Uh, and uh, by by support from uh, Europe, Canada, Mexico, many other countries, 
that are close friends of the United States, we're seeing this combination of, of carrot and stick begin to develop and money flowing into Cuba that is encouraging the democratic forces and encouraging the process of policy reform. Uh, I think that's important. You're not seeing that in North Korea. It's a very dangerous country. Uh, and there, Korea, uh, North Korea is basically is isolated from the world economy with one exception, China. China is the lifeline of North Korea, and China has a great deal of influence over North Korea. Uh, and therefore, cooperation with China in developing a balanced North Korean policy is critical for the medium and, and long-term success of improving uh, rights in, in North Korea. What is going on there in North Korea is terrible. We have just seen a, a, a wonderful, uh, uh, someone who escaped the prison camps in North Korea and has written and told his story of the torture and the, uh, and, and, uh, the abuses. Uh, China, though, uh, faces a difficult situation. If they join in a comprehensive embargo on North Korea, the whole country could implode, and the and the leaders would have a choice of either going, you know, going to a suicidal war or going to another form of suicide, and it, which would lead to massive migration of people from North Korea into China, and so partly to avoid the risk of nuclear war at this point uh, and, and massive migration on the other front, they are trying to find some balance. This is what countries are doing in North Korea, which I think is a much more dangerous situation than, than in Iran. Uh, uh, the Iranian situation is, is, is difficult. Uh, I, I wish we had spent more time uh, in the first panel because we had a wonderful uh, uh, introduction to that, that issue then. Uh, but uh, I think following uh, the advice we've heard, uh, mixing, you know, being more careful in planning sanctions, how they will be used in conjunction with the other efforts to promote democratic reform in these repressive regimes, I think is the key. And if countries would do that more carefully, planning the introduction of the measures and how we can unravel the measures, to further promote democratic reform, I think that's the that's the uh, the, uh, the uh, would be a much more productive way of promoting the very courageous work that is being done within each of these countries. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Natalia, uh, we can leave uh, sanctions for a little while, but uh, some kind of particle targeted boycotts. What, what's your impression or what's, uh, what are your preferences for someone uh, struggling for uh, uh, or co trying to control human rights abuses uh, in uh, Russia? If you see, for instance, some... Uh, uh, famous artist from the West, uh, so one of them says, like, I don't go to Russia because I, I not gonna support uh, uh, violence against Pussy Riot, for instance, and this and that, or you prefer that he comes and says during the concert, I support the uh, release of uh, Pussy Riot, what is more acceptable behavior for, or more welcome behavior from, uh, from uh, people like you in uh, Russia? Um, my personal opinion, I would prefer that uh, famous artists come to Russia, have their concert, etc., and during the conference from the, um, from the scene, say about the problems because it creates um, more attention to the human rights problems uh, among Russian, Russian people because we have not only the problems uh, with the human rights and a lot of human rights violations but also we have uh, problems with the uh, well coverage among the people knowing about the people about these problems and what could be done in order to change the situation. So my opinion is better if famous people come to Russia and speak openly about human rights, strictly, strongly, openly about human rights problems. 
thank you. I uh, caused you troubles by asking very specific questions, but do you want to add anything you uh, react uh, for what's, what was said before by uh, Igor or Mr. Short or? Okay, yes. So let's say to go or not to go. Uh, you know, I, I would say, let's say, go, but be careful how you go. Let's say. So go, but don't go, let's say, to basically self the, these bad regimes legitimize themselves. Let's say, many, many different people, let's say, go, let's say, to problematic places, and basically they help in one or another way regimes to legitimize themselves. Another thing, let's say many people go, let's say, to make themselves, they go kind of in an unhumble way. Let's say we sometimes we are going to the other places and we are so damn arrogant and ignorant. Let's say. So we basically go to other places, let's say, to feel good. Let's say, to do something, let's say, that kind of that we feel so heroic that we set these things in those, those countries. Let's say, and then we forgot, let's say, basically that we are in most of the case is protected. Let's say nothing happened to us. Let's say, so, so, so in a certain way, when you go somewhere, really be mindful. Let's say, don't think about, let's say, your own fame, your own kind of the doing this gesture which generate you the, the photos and, 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 and a good media coverage. But let's say carefully find the li- right contest in a certain way and put yourself in a purpose of the domestic agendas. Let's say, and there are always domestic people let's say, whom you can listen. Let's say how you can, let's say, f- help strengthen their own agenda. Let's say very often famous, more famous or less famous, let's say people go to other countries and basically they don't really carefully, mindfully listen, let's say, what are the domestic agendas, but they go, let's say, to kind of feel good, to do something that makes them feel good. Let's say. Okay, thanks. Do you want to add something? Yeah, I'm, I agree with what uh, Igor said, that the situations and uh, uh, particular situations are always different and it's quite important to listen to local people, what they're thinking and uh, what would be the best uh, tactic. uh, tactic. Uh, For example, uh, a few months ago uh, we've been asked uh, by some diplomats uh, from uh, Germany uh, who received invitation on some kind of uh, not high level uh, round table, but the round table organized uh, in a very good uh, premises with the support of a public chamber, and they've been asked us, uh, ever, is it okay or not to go and participate in this event? And this was purely the case of uh, legitimizing the situation, then Gong uh, became uh, the more important actors, and uh, uh, receiving the place of independent civil society. So our advice was not to go for not legitimized this uh, situation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, does uh, Minkunen want to add something to what? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let me speak in my mother language in Vamis, my English is very poor. <laughs> so, uh, I think I wanted to suggest uh, pressure and compromise policy and sensitive uh, and engagement. I mean, carrot and stick policy. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, it is important to uh, look uh, in some countries uh, from different policy uh, issues, uh, like uh, two different uh, policies we should apply. The democracy is not the in some countries like uh, North Korea, uh, we, should, uh, we should not uh, accept uh, uh, their um, activities or their policy, uh, which is totally against democracy. Uh, now, the 
ในกว่าแค่เรื่องเรื่องอะกูว่าตัวเราจะนอร์ดเซอร์ปูวิโรเราดิโมกราซีจะเอาเปลี่ยนนี่ได้เลยเอ้ยเราจะนั่งคุย
and in case they don't make any uh, changes, uh, what kind of challenges they are going to meet? The two targeted sensei, they are Musi, I don't know, do you have a so reform, don't need it, do they go encourage Lobido, the get hard line as you go, target Jibido, Visa, Ruba, Saboli, Yellow Damuha, the two Tia Musi, I don't know, the Ribu Mira. What I have noticed that uh, the targeted sanctions uh, have some effects. Uh, the people who are uh, doing, uh, who, who, who say that they are, they are uh, the reforming the, uh, the system, uh, but in reality uh, they are not, uh, and these people are still uh, being uh, sanctioned, uh, for example, for on, on their visa. There are some visa banned. Hello. จนนิโกชัวเมซุยเอ่อแซนชิงฮาตะเกอโรเพรชเชอร์แมกเกนิซึมตะคู่บาเวตะแพกกะเลคอมโพรไมซ์โกจูซาติโนเพรชเชอร
актеры и оркестр, и, как потом выяснилось, они получили колоссальные гонорары, то есть совершенно сверхъестественные, чуть ли не по полмиллиона долларов. И, конечно, участвовать в этом разгуле и фактически в ограблении населения – это неприлично, это совершенно очевидно. Сейчас недавно обсуждался, в том числе вот и с нами, вопрос о том, следует ли представителям Европейского Союза посетить Чечню и провести там собрание на тему о правах человека. И чуть было не поехали, как я понимаю. Но это тоже совершенно бессмысленная, конечно, была бы поездка. Она бы была чисто рекламная для Чечни, потому что были бы показаны Рамзан Кадыров и его окружение рядом с приличными людьми, и ничего больше. И, естественно, ничего больше не удалось бы увидеть, потому что вы видели только то, что показали. И когда-то приезжали журналисты из Европы в Чечню, и отдельное, так сказать, интервью давала им Наташа Истемирова, которую не хотели к ним пускать, и, наконец, вот все-таки они добились того, что к ней пустили, а сейчас, как известно, Наташа убита, и это ей не простилось. Поэтому и опасности подвергать людей, видимо, не следует, и участвовать в таких вещах не следует. С другой стороны, вот 10-11 проводится собрание омбудсменов, субъектов Российской Федерации в Ингушетии. И почему-то одновременно обсуждался этот вопрос о посещении Чечни и этого собрания омбудсменов, и по обоим случаям были приняты отрицательные решения. Вот мне кажется, вот я не знаю, согласятся ли со мной коллеги, что этого делать не следовало. Вот туда поехать было нужно, потому что там будут люди со всей России, потому что будут высказываться достаточно критические мнения. И я знаю, что в Ингушетии население, в общем, достаточно безопасно может говорить все, что оно думает, и прямо в лицо президенту, ну теперь он называется глава республики. И почему нужно проводить тут параллель и отказываться одновременно от того и другого, мне это непонятно. Что же касается санкций, мне кажется, что прекрасная есть санкция – это список Магнитского. Если бы Европа присоединилась к этому списку, то есть если бы не рукопожатными и невозможными для приема оказались конкретные лица из России, я думаю, что это было бы достаточно чувствительно. Я понимаю, что не самых высших фигур можно наказать таким образом, но достаточно, я думаю, чувствительно будет для и для других стран, и для России в частности, если будут наказаны конкретные нарушители прав человека. Абсолютно то, что называется точечное попадание. Спасибо. So if I understand it well, it uh, was it wasn't really a question, but it was uh, your short uh, speech. Uh, Does anyone want to react on this? Uh, perhaps Tatiana? Well, sorry, uh, Natalia. Yeah. <laughs> But actually, I, I agree with uh, what uh, Svetlana told, because uh, of course there are different situations, uh, and uh, with uh, Igor's uh, um, thesis uh, that it's very much important to listen local people and suggestions uh, either it would be good for human rights situation or bad before to decide either to go or not. Okay, thank you. And uh, so I would like to thank all the panelists and uh, we would uh, close this panel now and I would like to invite uh, uh, Mr. Karel Schwarzenberg for closing remarks at this conference for foreigners who are not uh, familiar with him. I would like to emphasize there are a few reasons why uh, he is here. One is that before he uh, returned to uh, Czechoslovakia after 1989, he was uh, uh, himself uh, very actively working uh, like, uh, uh, like one of the presidents of Helsinki Committee for Human Rights Watch. Uh, and uh, he himself participated in, like an observer, in po trials with political prisoners in this country, which I myself could witness in 1988. Uh, 
After he uh, came back to Czechoslovakia, he became the chancellor of uh, Václav Havel uh, of, uh, at uh, his presidential office. And uh, the third reason is he is also a founder of this NGO, which uh, is organizing this conference together with uh, Charter 77 Foundation. He is a founder of uh, Václav Havel's library. And currently, he is in the middle of a very hot political campaigning, so we are happy he found uh, some time to speak to us. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, thanking you all that you took part in this conference, uh, because it is maybe more necessary than ever. Because human rights, like any human activity, uh, is subordinated to, to fashion. There are times when human rights are in fashion for political reasons, and there are times when nobody cares a bloody damn about human rights. And we are more approaching the time where uh, we care less and less about human rights. Uh, I, as was mentioned by the Masachik, I was a pupil and had the honor to work with Václav Havel, and so I know that in the fight for human rights, one may be one of the most important thing is consistency. Consistency is, in a way, in diplomacy, but especially if you fight for human rights of a great importance. There are many voices, lamentably in my country here too, who say that human rights are nice things, but there are more important things in the world and that, for instance, if you are Minister of Foreign Affairs, which was what was my job uh, till last spring, you should care more about um, economic question and take political care not to offend somebody than to be involved in human rights. Well, Václav Havel told us that it is just the opposite is the right thing. One should always fight for human rights. And where it, in each country and, and speak about human rights, if it is a great country or a small country, if it is a country which is important for you or not important, that this is the only right way to do. And now I can tell you something my, of my own experience. Because of course, some people said, Guy Schwarzweig, who came uh, from the Helsinki Federation for Human Rights and was involved, he takes too much care on human rights and was neglecting uh, the economic interests of this country. Well, so I looked at the figures and I found out that even in the countries which he criticized most, uh, the exchange and, and trade exploded during my ministership. So it is not correct to say that if you care about human rights, you are, it is a disadvantage for your own country. The only thing which, of course, I found out comparing this politics with other countries, and of course my own country too, which is most important is consistency. Is diplomacy is very much, especially if you are a smaller country, like the Czech Republic, is about to appear and to be a reliable partner. A partner where other powers, other countries, they can rely how he behaves, what his attitude is, and what his main points of politics are. And if you are consistent in human rights, um, all along, after some gambling and after some 
that's the explanations and dealings, even Belgrade powers accept it. Uh, well, in those countries where I saw there are problems with human rights, when I received a new ambassador, I told him, oh, it is nice to see you and the usual diplomatic floskel and, and, and phrases you spell, and then said, I have to tell you something. Uh, my political career started with human rights, and I'm still involved. And I don't intend to drop that. So be aware that if you are speaking with me as, as Minister of Foreign Affairs, you are speaking to somebody who is very much interested in human rights, and even in human rights in your own country. And I will be involved even if it's, you don't like it and it is not pleasant to you. That doesn't mean that in other questions we can very well cooperate and in certain questions I will even support you. But this is a point which I would like to mention to you at the very beginning of our relationship. That was always, the people, they were surprised. But then when they saw that our policy is consistent, and that I'm speaking about human rights, not only to them, but to other countries too, be they small or be they large, be they important in, in trade relations or very remote and not so interesting trade relations, that it was always the same topic in the same way we treated human rights relations. After some time, they accepted it. And as I told you, I realized that it didn't hurt at all our trade or, or, or commercial interest. But I know of other countries who are sometimes changing their policy, sometimes more for interior political reasons, because a campaign was starting or something, suddenly they stressed human rights, and then half a year later they dropped it again. Uh, those countries can be blackmailed because there the human rights violators, perpetrators, know exactly that they are not really tough on it, that they are soft on the subject. And you can move them by blackmailing them with sanctions, with, uh, with um, break of trade relations, and so on and so on. So, uh, maybe the only thing which I would like to stress here, the, the importance of two things, to be consistent the whole time and to uh, be consistent uh, observing human rights and fighting for them against each country. So no country says, but you close your eyes in the country B and you are only uh, speaking to us, to country A, about human rights. We have always to put, do have the same policy in human rights to the country B and C too. And then it will be accepted. Of course, as always, in a democratic country, you have to convince your own parliament about this effect too. And of course, as in parliament, merit very different interests different interests of great companies, uh, different uh, political parties, and so on. Uh, so you can be very well criticized. Sometimes quite easy. Uh, you didn't behave with the due respect to this or the other country. Be cool. Listen to it, answer friendly and politely, and don't change your policy. As I told you, consistency in human rights is maybe the most important thing, then it is accepted. Because in the back of the mind, even the greatest perpetrators uh, and very tough rulers know that what they are, do they are doing is not right and that it is not internationally accepted. They know it very well. And so if you are consistent, all along they accept it. This may be about um, 
human, fighting for human rights in official positions today. Of course, um, even if you are full of goodwill and if you are really willing to do something for human rights in an official position, you can't do it and or you lose your battle if you have not the minimal support of NGOs. Because only the NGOs and sometimes the press uh, can mobilize the public to your support. And as you know, uh, a politic who has no support for, for, for his policy, let me end as a politician. So uh, it is of enormous importance that all the NGOs who are involved in some way with human rights and all the journalists are be very caring and, and e immediately raise their voice if they see that the politician is getting softer or gets under pressure about the policy for human rights. That's why we are the most important things in our days too. And then, as I told you at the beginning, we have to face the, the sad fact that politics are a part of human activity and that, as I said, that there are times, like in the 80s, when human rights are in fashion, and then there are times when they get out of fashion. Again, there's consistency necessary. You have to speak and to write about it, even in times uh, when there's no special interest, especially in between politicians uh, or the public for human rights. After some time, as it, the fashion turns again, and human rights will be again in fashion. But you have to, to be consistent, even in the time when it seems that nobody is really interested in human rights. Because human rights violations happen always, in, and in much more countries than we think. We are discussing here maybe as a best known and, and where it's really with very tough regimes. But uh, seemingly softer regimes, seemingly even democratic regimes who violate human rights in some aspects too. So you have, again, not to specialize only on unpleasant and unsympathetic uh, authoritarian regimes, dictators, or so, but you have to be careful about democratic countries too, and most of all, you have to care for human rights in your own country. Because as, as I told you, human rights violations happen in each country, in this country too. And I think one should always start cleaning up at home. Then you can criticize the others. And I very well know in which aspects we are violating the human rights in, our, in this country too. And I try to speak about it and try to work on it that too. So please, in whichever country you are, to be credible, you have to be critical about the human rights situation in your own country. And if you work on it, you suddenly detect that there are in each country some dark corners where things happen which you can, which are violating human rights. So maybe this, to the end of your meeting, I was very happy you met here. I think it was that what Vaslav Havel wished when he detected this old church and changed it into a center of meetings of people who are interested in human rights, in democracy, and so on. And he, to his last, last days, he was a fighter of human rights. Where he was already really very weak. And he, 
he looking terrible. A week before he died, he got up just to see the Dalai Lama, to express him his support. Uh, he was a real fighter for human rights. So I think it, it is in his spirit, and we are ful fulfilling his wish and his dream if we are working in this former church on the human rights question in the world. Thank you for listening to me. Dear distinguished guest, this is really the end of the conference. I thank you very much that you came, and I hope next year many people will come to the event and the conference was uh, will be put it on the YouTube, and we will be glad if you can distribute it in your country to interested people who would like to listen to our panels and it will be open, distributed around the world. Thank you very much, and I would like to invite you to a cocktail which will be in the end of uh, the church, and we can talk informal to each other, and please enjoy the evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>